I'm Casey James, and this is the story of the Bridge House. I entered through the foyer, past a set of stairs leading upwards, and walked into what must once have been the main living room of the house. It was double height, open up to the ceiling, above the second floor, with some sort of mezzanine above, red-tinted light pouring in through several skylights. I couldn't see the pattern on the skylights themselves from where I was standing, but the patterns of coloured light bleeding in across the walls and floors looked like thorns. The room itself felt cavernous, eerily silent, with a thick carpet the colour of old blood underfoot, and drapes along the walls to eat every sound that made it past the thick old stone walls. I could hear my pulse in my ears, like the roaring of the sea, because I couldn't hear anything else. Not a whisper. Not a brush of the wind that was rising outside, or a creak of the floorboards that must, surely, lie beneath that hideous carpet with its thorny trails of coloured light. There wasn't even the slightest hint of sound or movement in the air. I wet my lips, conscious suddenly of how isolated this strange house was and how alone I felt standing within it. Papers were scattered across the carpet and the walnut coffee table that stood between a pair of dark leather couches. Newspaper clippings, loose pages from what had to be several old books, printed in spidery script, and pages torn from notebooks. They looked like fallen leaves after a storm, a false autumn with that dark red carpet and the brown and golden yellow drapes hiding any windows and half the walls. Against the far wall, where any modern house would have a TV or maybe a projector, there was an upright piano, black and glossy like patent leather. It looked almost garish, an incongruous patch of oily darkness against the wooden fittings and autumn colours. A book stood, open, on the piano stand, but it didn't look like sheet music. I knew that I should go and take a look, perhaps even sort through the papers on the ground and the table, but for the longest time I simply stood still, my feet sinking into the carpet, and stared at the strange place I found myself. Eventually, I had to move. I gathered the snowdrift of loose papers first and tried to put them in some sort of order. There was no logic to them. I found pieces, pages from several books, including three pages of a play by someone named Robert Chambers and several pages that weren't even in English, as in, they weren't even in the same alphabet. I didn't recognize the characters. There were a few newspaper clippings, all about this very house. The Bridge House, they called it, although none of them explained the name. There's no bridge anywhere near here, and the house itself doesn't stand near a river or lake at all. It was only when I reached the torn-out notebook pages that any of it began to make sense to me. They were all written by one person, all in the same handwriting, and there was a letter in the same hand, signed... Kezia Gilman. It looked like Gilman might have been the last person to stay at the bridge house, more than five years ago, if the dates on the newspaper clippings were anything to go by, which made some sense, given the house technically belonged to her, or to her family at least. There was a copy of an old bill of sale for it, to one Walter Gilman, in 1923, stacked between receipts for chalk and pig's blood, of all things. There were also a lot of pages of equations that I couldn't make head or tail of, but Kezia referenced some research papers published by Walter Gilman, up in Arkham, through something called the Miskatonic Society. I made a note of the titles of the papers to look up later and see if they made any more sense than the scattered mishmash of symbols and graphs Kezia had left scattered across the living room.
In any case, seemed like the bridge house had been playing host to some strange things for a while now. The earliest newspaper clipping was from the late 1800s, about the disappearance of one Thomas Bird and his friend, Alistair Gilman, who had been accused of murdering some foreigner. Both men had been remanded to the custody of the local town's magistrate. This was the first I'd heard of any such town, to be honest. There was nothing in the maps, or the guidebook I'd picked up at the last town. In any case, both men had vanished from the locked room in which they had been left in the magistrate's house, the Bird family being both wealthy and influential enough to disincline the magistrate from leaving their son in the constable's lock-up overnight. Interesting as the story was, the most interesting part of it was the fact that the magistrate's house was this very building, which did not seem to be known at the time as the bridge house. The next newspaper clipping recorded the unfortunate magistrate, driven entirely mad by some sort of awful dreams and portents of evil. This was the 1930s to the point that he ran from the house and all the way into town. Again, what town? Naked as the day he was born. He was remanded to an asylum upstate near Arkham, and the newspaper quoted him raving about the beasts that dwelled in the world beneath the world. There was a note on the clipping, in Kezia's handwriting, which said, See testimony of Charles Dexter Ward. But I didn't find any notes referring to that testimony. Not until much later on. A series of clippings dated after that recorded several scandals and instances of ill luck plaguing everyone who bought or lived in the bridge house. They even referred to it as the bridge house by the late 1930s, although there was no reason given. The last clipping was an article about Walter Gilman's discovery of a body in the woods below the house along with a bag which turned out to contain several Egyptian artefacts and other valuables stolen from the National Museum of Antiquities. There were no further articles, and most of the ripped-out pages of notepaper were full of complex algebra, those equations which made no sense. There were two notes worth mentioning, though. One, dated five years ago to the day, said simply, I found it. Ward was right, and then the rest of the page was filled with more of the mathematical gibberish that covered so many of the pages I'd collected from where they lay around the room. The second was a drawing, rather like da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, but female, with an apple placed over her genitals and a scarab beetle over her heart. I held on to both pages, although I couldn't really have told you why, and edged past the couches to the upright piano and the journal resting on its music stand. The book was closed, although I swear it had been open when I looked before. Its black leather cover was almost as glossy as the piano itself, with that same air of slick oiliness. Opening it, I knew what I'd find. Kezia Gilman's handwriting, ink bleeding into the paper. They told me the rights were lost, Kezia wrote in the first entry in that journal. But nothing is truly lost that is known in the dark place. It was difficult to acquire the records, but the head of psychiatry in Arkham is a man, and men are fools. The touch of his hands disgusted me, dissimilar as they were to my master's hands, but I allowed it. His eyes glazed over with barely a kiss, my hand down his pants and his under my shirt, and then he was mine, and so were the last words of Charles Dexter Ward, recorded by these complacent imbeciles who will never know what they have done. It seems strange to me now, but reading that, I couldn't help but picture it. Kezia, with her dark eyes, coldly analytical, and her voluptuous mouth, her skin visible through the light, white blouse she wore. The head of psychiatry at some nameless hospital in Arkham, a middle-aged white man, as they so often are, sliding his hands under that translucent shirt 
like fleshy spiders crawling across her body while she jerked him off. The rhythmic motions of it. Her hand moving and his hands moving on her while she moaned and bit her lips and watched him come apart under her touch. All the while thinking of this other lover, this master she mentioned. Kinky. I don't know how long I stood there in front of the piano, staring at that journal while the heavy, oppressive silence weighed me down. But the last of the sunlight was gone by the time I turned away. In the fading edge of twilight, which seeped in through the picture windows like a fog from the overgrown lawn outside, I tried the closest light switch. I don't know that I expected it to work, but it did. A dim, golden light flooded the room, yellow in the way that old-fashioned incandescence can be. It startled me, I'll admit, turned that autumn-coloured room into something more, something other. I don't know. Kezia's words sank into my brain, black ink soaking through the paper of that journal until I expected to find it bleeding through and dripping over my hands. The very last line on the last page. I will find the apple and the scarab and perform the rite, and the dark man will answer. I couldn't help but imagine Kezia herself standing in this room. In my mind, she was the same height as me, but paler, with long dark hair that matched the mahogany shadows of the room, the slick black gloss of the piano. I imagined her long, pale fingers moving across the ivory keys, pausing as she looked up and smiled, a stretch of lips that didn't reach her eyes, those long, pale fingers reaching out to me, drifting, ghost quiet and gentle across my skin as she brushed my arm. Goose flesh rose in my arms at that imagined touch, and a chill walked down my spine. I shook myself and looked around again. There was no sign of a housekeeper or caretaker, and I couldn't imagine anyone would come in here and leave that snowdrift of papers scattered across the living room floor, although I suppose I was doing just that, for all I'd tried to collect most of them. Oh well. To my left, past the light switch, an open door led into what looked like a home office. The walls behind the beautiful walnut desk were bare concrete, soot-stained, as if there had been a fire in there at one point. Singed tatters of wallpaper hung in a few places. The pattern, blue on white, like old china, and my footsteps echoed and scuffed on the bare stone floor as I entered. It was still silent, but here the silence was tense and watchful not the all-encompassing quiet of the living room, which swallowed any sound. Ash and soot covered the floor, in a thin, fine layer, with no footprints in it, except those I was leaving as I entered the room. The only piece of furniture in there was that desk, glossy, dark, golden-brown wood, untouched by whatever inferno had singed the walls and left ash on the floor. The drawers were all open and empty, but on the desktop, right in the center, was... Well, there's no pretty way of describing it. A heart. I couldn't have said what animal it might have come from. It was horrible, in that slow, creeping way that things have in a nightmare, when you know that looking at them will only make them worse. It sat there, a gobbet of meat the size of my head, dark red and pulsing, beating, slow and steady, sitting in a small pool of old black blood. The whole room had that charnel house, butcher's back room stench of meat and blood, but underlaid with the subtle revolting sweetness of rot. On the desk, 
held in place by that awful beating heart, was a sheaf of photographs, black and white prints on glossy paper. The picture on the top of the stack was of a woman, pale and dark-haired, one corner of the photograph stained red-brown where it lay soaking in the edge of the pool of blood under that heart. She was pretty, in an Eastern European way, with high cheekbones and sharp features, flat, knowing eyes, and a smile that stretched her lips without changing the rest of her face. It was Kezia Gilman, just as I had imagined her, sitting at the piano with those long, pale fingers and that expressive mouth which tasted of copper and flowers. But how could I know that? How could I know what it felt like, kissing her? How could I possibly be aware that Kezia only smiled properly, a smile that went all the way up to her eyes, when she was winning the game, watching someone do something degrading and filthy, something they wouldn't have done if she hadn't asked? I shuddered, leaning away from the desk. In front of me, that weird, horrible heart pulsed slowly, and the bloodstain slowly expanded and leached further across the photograph, sliding over Kezia's face. She would have liked that, old, rotten blood sliding down her perfect pale skin like a physical sign of metaphysical corruption. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I heard her laughing, cool and bright. Now, this would have been the point where I should have just walked away. I should have left the study, opened the front door back up, and left the bridge house entirely. Instead, I edged closer and pulled the other photographs out from under the picture of Kezia. There was an old photograph of a pale, serious-looking young man, probably a reproduction, since it had the look of those 19th-century pictures, nothing modern about it at all. Another of a collection of Egyptian artefacts, several decorative pieces, jewellery, a carved scarab that was probably gold or copper, certainly metallic. Another picture of Kezia, or perhaps an ancestress, who looked a great deal like her, since she was dressed in a 1920s frock, hair cut in an ear-length bob and a cigarette smoking in a metal cigarette holder in her left hand. That picture also captured an older gentleman, and in the foreground, a book. I couldn't read the title, but the dark cover was embossed with a stylized picture of a catfish, and a glyph that brought to mind that vision I'd had at the front door the crook and flail of Osiris, the risen god. Thunder crashed outside, making me jump and look up, although there were no windows in this room for me to see the storm coming in. When I looked back at the photographs, the Kezia in the first picture seemed to have turned her head to look at me, blood dripping down her face. I swear... She was staring right at me with those dark, smoky eyes, and there was a hint of a smirk on her mouth that hadn't been there before. I backed quickly out of the room and shut the door. My heart was beating too fast, and there was a cold sweat down my back.